What do root vegetables, horseshoes, the groundhog, and the goddess Brigitte have in common? Well, they are the stuff of two midwinter rituals I want to talk about today. Are you curious? I hope so. Stay tuned. You're listening to Ritual Recipes, a podcast full of practical magic to nourish your inner life. Here in my cosmic kitchen, I'll share rituals you can DIY to help you acknowledge achievements, celebrate events, deepen your connection to the world and to those around you, and bring a sense of inner peace. I'm your host, Zita Christian. I've been creating and performing rituals for large groups, families, couples, and individuals for more than 20 years. This is episode two. I'm tapping into the energy of midwinter. I live in Connecticut. Winters here are long and cold. In early February, folks look to the groundhog to predict the coming of spring. Early on February 2nd, he pops up from his underground den. If he sees his shadow, the sun is weak, and we can expect six more weeks of winter. If he doesn't see his shadow, the sun is strong, and spring will come early. Instead of consulting the groundhog, my Celtic ancestors Look to the goddess Brigitte for signs of spring. The main dish ritual that I want to share with you today is inspired by my Celtic heritage. At the heart of the ritual is the goddess Brigitte, also known as Bride or Breed or Saint Bridget. I have a simple snack size ritual to share with you too. Let me set the scene. It's midwinter. Even though we have snow on the ground, we can see and feel an increase in light. The sun is warming Mother Earth. We can see a few early signs of spring. Sure, the trees are still bare, but that makes it easy for the birds of prey to spot the mice and the squirrels and the small birds. This is when the hawks have their babies. Now, since the winter solstice of last December, the days have grown longer. We can see the difference. We can also feel the difference teased by just one brief spell of warm weather and we feel a surge of energy something inside us stirs and at the same time life underground quickens in the roots for months some part of us has been hibernating and now well and now we feel eager hopeful and restless a simple ritual for the season is to connect with the food that grows under the ground, absorbing the nutrients in the soil. So gather some root vegetables, get some potatoes, onions, carrots, beets, yams, parsnips, and more. As you prep the vegetables for a meal, think about the nutrients they provide and the magic that they represent. Here are three examples. I'm gonna start with the potatoes. There was a time when potatoes, members of the nightshade family, were thought to be poisonous. Many years later, that idea proved false, thank goodness. Loaded with vitamins B6 and C, as well as potassium, magnesium, and a lot of other good things, there's a lot to love about the spud. You know, if you cut a potato into pieces, each one is capable of generating new life. And if you don't believe me, do that and plant little pieces in the soil and watch the pretty leaves that come out, the pretty vines. For many years, what we think of as the humble potato was an essential crop in Ireland. It was a favorite in Lithuania, too. In his book, A Compendium of Herbal Magic, author Paul Beryl talks about the Lithuanian potato harvest and the ritual of honoring the one who digs up the last potato by naming her old potato woman. Beryl also talks about the honor given to potatoes in Peru. There, the tuber has its own spirit, and she is called Aksomama. So the next time you prep potatoes, do this simple ritual. Cut the potato and say, thank you for your life-giving spirit. When you eat the potatoes, thank those once called old potato woman claim the title for yourself or claim a title of your own choosing. I like Sassy Spud Girl. Now let's talk about carrots. 
My sister Eileen is a master gardener. She always has a big garden, and every seed she plants always grows twice. One year, she rimmed her garden with a two-story layer of cinder blocks, and into both holes of each block she planted carrots. Not having tried this form of planting before, she wasn't sure of how it would turn out, so she planted not one but several carrot seeds in each hole. And you can guess what happened. She had a bumper crop. The carrots grew so big, they filled the holes right to the edge. My husband and I helped her pull them out. I think some of those carrots ran so deep they went all the way to China. And therein lies some of the carrots' magic. Freeing them from the soil builds strength and works up an appetite. Succeeding gives a feeling of confidence. If you've never tasted a carrot just pulled from the earth and rinsed with the garden hose, you are missing one of life's pleasures. And then there's the shape of the carrot and its suggestion of fertility. So next time you cook carrots, say, I'm grateful for the willpower, the strength, the confidence you offer me. And if you're so inclined, you can also say, may your power fertilize the wish in my heart. Now let's talk onions. In the early 1900s, my grandparents homesteaded on the Dakota Territory. They had to be self-sufficient, and that included making their own medicine. When my dad reminisced about his childhood, he often talked about the pot of onion syrup that sat on the kitchen stove all winter. My grandmother swore by her goopy cure-all, Now, she lived into her 90s. I can't say that her onion syrup had anything to do with it, but I do know onions have long been valued for their healing properties. In fact, it wasn't that long ago that people believed that simply cutting an onion in half and leaving it in a room would absorb the sickness in the room. The National Onion Association points to the onion's ability to reduce the risk of developing gastric ulcers and the onion's ability to trigger insulin production and regulate blood sugar. And then there's the poetic reflection on the skin-thin layers of an onion and how the truth of a matter is revealed as each layer is peeled away. So next time you are peeling and chopping onions, Don't get upset if they make you cry. Instead, say, These are tears of gratitude. Thank you for supporting my health and my authenticity. Now, whatever root vegetables you use for this ritual, keep in mind that a ritual is a visible act performed with invisible intent. The invisible intent with this simple root ritual is to be nourished by the magic of the vegetables. The visible act is, you guessed it, eat the vegetables. Now I want to tell you about a community ritual that is based on an ancient midwinter festival called Imbolc, I-M-B-O-L-C. I've created several versions of this ritual and conducted them over the years at Meg's Inspirations. It's a spiritual boutique here in Manchester, Connecticut. I'll put a link in the show notes. Imbolc is an old, old Celtic solar festival held in early February. It celebrates the fulfillment of the promise made at the winter solstice. Light has returned. My Celtic ancestors would have celebrated Imbolc with the goddess Brigid, also known as Bride or Breed, and eventually as St. Bridget. In Greek mythology, This is when the goddess Persephone lights her lamp in the underworld and begins her journey upward. She'll arrive on the spring equinox. In Scandinavian countries, the Festival of Lights features a girl who wears a crown of candles. The girl is known today as St. Lucy. In New England, the most recognized symbol of the season is the groundhog. The word in bulk means in the belly or in the milk and refers to the many pregnant ewes, more visible evidence that spring is on the way. So pay attention, and you'll discover other signs of spring, too. 
the chirping of birds, more animal tracks in the snow, increased activity from birds of prey, growing physical energy, and for some of us, an urge to clean the house. The keeper of knowledge, the Celtic goddess Brigid, is an alchemist, and she calls us to her sacred well this time of the year. In the water, we see our reflection and the burdens that we carry. We are invited at this festival to lay our burden down, to tell our story, to rekindle our inner fire, and to be healed. This celebration of Imbolc focused on Brigid in her three forms, goddess of healers, of smithcrafters, and of poets. As the goddess of healers, Brigid knows the power of earth and water. Water quenches thirst, soothes aches, cleanses wounds, washes away what we no longer wish to carry, what we no longer can carry. She knows that flood water can destroy and womb water can protect. Brigid knows the healing power of herbs, one of the many gifts from the earth. If you lived in times gone by, you'd see Brigid in deep wells and dark pools, in plants growing wild in meadows and forests, and hanging in bunches from cottage rafters to dry. During the Imbolc ritual, each of us sprinkled dried herbs on the water in a bird bath that we reimagined as one of Brigid's sacred wells. As the goddess of smithcrafters, particularly blacksmiths, Brigid knows the power of fire. It lights the dark, cooks our food, warms the cold. A bonfire on a beach, a candle on a cake, a torch in a sports arena, a sacred flame guarded by centuries of devoted keepers. Each flame is a bit of the life-giving force of the sun. If you lived in times gone by, you'd see Brigid's alchemical fire at the blacksmith's forge, where couples would pledge their love and bind both their hearts and their hands. Now you see her power in the design of a wrought iron gate and in a cast iron skillet in a hand fasting court at a wedding ceremony. During the Imbolc ritual, each of us dropped a tear of frankincense resin in a cauldron of hot coals reimagined as a blacksmith's forge. Goddess of poets, Brigid knows the power of air, of words formed from ideas. Words can articulate a new thought just as they can preserve the ideas of ages gone by. Strung together with love, words can soothe, inspire, affirm, rally to the just cause. Strung together with hate, words can cut, deceive, undermine, bully the weak. Brigid knows that the magic of a spell is conjured by the power of words. If you lived in times gone by, you'd see her as the bard, the shanaki telling stories in the pub. Now you see her in a poetry slam, at a book reading, a memorial service. During the Imbolc ritual, each of us spoke a word we wanted to empower with hope. We said peace love, security, respect, courage, and more and more words. Three times we spoke the words, each time louder, louder, and faster, and faster, each word flying like a bird into the plume of frankincense smoke. Now, whenever I create a community ritual like this one, I incorporate something tangible that the participants can keep as a reminder of the magic they created by being together in sacred space. For this in bulk ritual, I used horseshoes. In mythology, the horse is seen as a power animal. In dreams, the horse can represent personal power. Once we harness the horse, it can take us wherever we want to go. And once we respect the horse, we deepen our understanding of friendship and loyalty. Thanks to Meg's contacts, that's Meg, the owner of the shop, I had an assortment of horseshoes, 
full-sized and well-worn. I placed them around a cast-iron cauldron to symbolize the power created in the blacksmith's forge. During the Imbolc ritual, each person chose an image of a horse. Now these images were on they were photocopied on paper, turned face down in a basket, so people chose them sight unseen. There were farm horses, carriage horses, circus horses, show horses, war horses, winged horses, fairy tale horses, pink ponies, and unicorns. We spent a little time talking about the qualities of the horse on the picture we'd chosen, and then I asked everyone, men and women, to talk about their first experience driving a car, today's version of the horse. Some women recalled being eager to drive, some apprehensive. One man talked about the status symbol of being 16 and having his own wheels. We talked about the need to care for a car and to maintain it properly. We talked about fancy options and horrific accidents. Each scenario related in some way to how we experience our personal power. As I told everyone there that night, it takes courage to tell our stories. A story might reveal failure or loss, vulnerability or regret. But there is magic in the telling, for in recounting the tale, a story might also reveal the gift of experience, achievement, wisdom, and joy. It is said that one of Brigid's most valuable gifts is that of Imbas, I-M-B-A-S, the power of perception. The tangible reward for telling a story about power was a small horseshoe, well, actually a pony shoe, decorated with red and white ribbons, Brigitte's colors of fire and ice, blood and milk. To further empower the bond created in the ritual, I took a moment near the end and gathered everyone together, and we huddled in a circle, arms outstretched, holding our horseshoes. Just imagine all the colorful ribbons streaming down from our fingers. And just as you might clink glasses in a toast, we made sure that our horseshoes all touched. We celebrated courage, power, and shifts in perception. My own horseshoe now sits on my desk, a strong and colorful reminder that what has been stirring underground for months is about to surface. Can you feel the power of the season? Can you feel your own power? Are you open to a change of perception? Think about all this the next time you get in your car and remember the horse and bring it. You can find ritual recipes on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you consume your podcasts. If you like the taste of this episode, please subscribe. That way you won't miss an episode and you can help others find the show. Ritual Recipes is a side dish of MoonRiverRituals.com, the mother website, where I've worked since 2012 as a certified life cycle celebrant to officiate more than 100 weddings, bless babies, perform vow renewals, conduct funerals and memorial services, and create seasonal rituals for private circles and public gatherings. For more about these rituals, please visit the website MoonRiverRituals.com. Look for the Ritual Recipes page. That's where you'll find the show notes for this episode, number two. Rituals keep us oriented to the natural world. That's what this in bulk ritual was all about. Rituals deepen our connection to our own inner world. That's what the root vegetable ritual was all about. A ritual can be as simple or as substantial as you want. The only ingredient you really need is intent. I believe in the power of rituals. If you do too, or if you just want to know a little more, please join me for the next episode. I'll put the coffee on.